Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it and comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website in enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. Kind of wrap up on the real estate market, if you would, and I want to talk about your latest book uh, here. What, what are your yep. thoughts on any particularly more at, uh, attractive markets? I know there are a lot of unattractive markets, for sure. You're talking about migration flows and so forth. First of all, it's going to be uh, a long crawl back for regional housing prices. And the prices will still decline in, uh, through most of 2010 and then will turn around and start to, to rebound. But the rebound will take a good long while. Probably by 2010, the decline in prices across the United States will have been around 40%. So uh, right now it's around 25 percent. Yeah, and I I kind of personally see California declining about another 10 percent or so. Where do you think those declines will be worst? Will they be in the expensive markets? Will they be uh, in the, 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 the you know, speculated markets? And you had you had mentioned them before that California, Florida, New York, Nevada, Arizona, those are those are the worst. The most modest declines have been kind of in the energy belt as you go up the Rocky Mountains. And so you're talking about Texas and Oklahoma and the Dakotas and Montana, you know, anywhere. And actually, Louisiana, I mean, anywhere where they they have energy that's kind of that, that can give them an economy that's a counter to what's uh, what's going on. Actually, the Northeast, like New York, there was a lot of aggressive speculation, uh, Massachusetts. But Pennsylvania didn't uh, wasn't that bad, and and Ohio wasn't that bad. West Virginia uh, wasn't that bad. So the downturn in those states is more modest, and so the recovery should uh, should be a little quicker. You know, overall, we think the last to climb out will be Florida and Arizona and Nevada, where they had the most aggressive speculative lending. You know, New York has been hit by uh, the whole financial industry. Pro- you know. Although that even that is more, you know, you'd mentioned this earlier, and it was a really good point. That's more been in terms of wages than it has employment. The, the number of jobs in the financial industry, the loss there is nowhere close to the loss of, of uh, wages and compensation. California, you know, the, the fact that you started in so early into this decline, we think it means that, in fact, the, the downturn is going to play out relatively swiftly. You're already well into the foreclosure process, and when you look at income trends and you look at how much the prices have fallen, in fact, you know a lot of the housing is is uh, undervalued. The areas of the country besides the the Northeast being stable, Pennsylvania, Washington, Oregon, Utah, they have relatively good economies. The areas that have fared the best have been uh, Texas, maybe Oklahoma, and, and Texas. And New Hampshire, actually, when you, which is interesting. That's kind of Texas, an oddball in there, yeah. Well, yeah, and they're an oddball in the whole Northeast, but they have the lowest state and local tax burden in the United States, and Texas is not far behind. And Texas, of course, has the severance tax on oil to, to, to prop them up and keep taxes low. But And they have probably the most free market set of government regulations. Uh, in those two states. So their economies have not taken as big a hit and their housing market is going to come out, uh, we think, a little a little faster. So it's definitely, is, as you had started started out saying, it's very location specific and it and depends on you know, the, the factors in that conceptual framework that we, that we talked about. But it, things are starting to turn and housing prices are starting to go up because there's so many bargains out there that there are people who are willing to consider 
consider buying, not at the high end, of course. In the, in the bread and butter end. One thing that you you didn't mention, two states, is the mid-Atlantic area, the Carolinas, north and south. Any thoughts on those? Okay. Um, again, <laughs> that could be sort of location-specific because South Carolina, not bad. Uh, north Carolina, worse than South Carolina. Overall, not as bad as the nation. Now, Charlotte, of course, uh, right now a disaster uh, because of... Due to banking. Banking, Wachovia, and the financial services. And again, it's that conceptual framework. When you stand back and you look at those states, the growth in the United States, the metropolitan areas that have been growing over the last 25 years have been metropolitan areas with higher temperatures. (laughs) So, you know, you look at North Carolina and South Carolina, do they have high quality of life in terms of temperature, air quality, relatively low cost land because, you know, most of those two states is, is, is undeveloped. Yeah, they do. And so over the long haul, do they have some real competitive advantages? Yes. And with air conditioning and other and telecommunications and so forth, they also now, you know, you can locate your corporate headquarters there and you're not going to be, you, you'll be hardly disadvantaged. So, you know, in looking at those two states, South Carolina is doing better than North Carolina. Neither one of them has had the peak to trough decline that we've had throughout most of the nation. I'm sort of surprised that, you know, we're we're getting kind of interested in in Phoenix again, and we haven't looked at that market for about four years. Uh, I think our timing was pretty good. But when prices, you know, prices have been cut in half, it's cheaper to own a house in Phoenix than it is to rent it for the same house. Yeah. It seems like Phoenix is getting pretty interesting. Am I wrong on that? Yeah, I guess the question in my mind with regards to Phoenix is, are they going to grow at a, 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 is their growth rate going to be positive, but at a decreasing rate? And I say that because they've grown so rapidly that I think they're going to hit that minor brick wall. I don't know if minor or not, but that brick wall that fast growing areas do, which is congestion, crowded labor markets, rising prices on everything, you know, higher levels of inflation. You know, they, they have a cost of living that's about 9% above the nation. And part of that's just because that have been they've been uh, they were growing so quickly cost of doing business is not bad but their housing markets you know they're they're overbuilt and so it's going to take a while to, for the inventory to go down they have a concentration of course in aerospace and that industry is kind of you know leveled off they do have a lot of computer and electronics uh, manufacturing but that is actually been in decline. They have a mortgage delinquency rate that's higher than the nation, you know, that'll have to be worked out. So I'm sure they have some mortgage resets that are that are still coming. So it, it yeah, they've, they've been a, a high performing growth uh, metropolitan area, but I think they've taken a, a, a larger hit than most areas of the country. And right now, same things are happening other places where housing prices are starting to cause a, a turnaround in housing sales, but will it lead to a uh, housing permit quickly? You know, I don't think so. With the low cost of doing business, they still are going to uh, be attractive to businesses in Southern California. So, you know, we, we our outlook for Phoenix is that over the, the longer haul, the entrenched tech industries and the solid demographic trends will drive you know, above average growth, but it won't be the boom growth that you had during from, you know, like the last recession till the current recession. It won't be at that level. It'll be more in line with the growth rates uh, overall in the United States. One of the things we talked about on this show, and I know we're going a bit long here. I do want to get in some stuff about your book, and maybe we can have you back on to talk about it in detail because it's so interesting. But one of the things, when you look at governmental policy, I heard just last week that Phoenix, or not Phoenix, but Arizona passed a new bill. The attempt is to disincentivize foreclosures and make people hang on to their properties now that they've gotten much cheaper. And and they've done something with deficiencies saying that if you go into foreclosure, and of course there's going to be a big deficiency probably, the lender can go after you. I think they've made that easier for the lender. I know that they can do that in multiple states and you know judicial foreclosures and so forth. But that was just kind of an interesting point I wanted to bring up that may stem the tide of foreclosures a little bit there. I'm not sure. Well, we're we're seeing, you know, the the peak net immigration to Phoenix was, and the the population in Phoenix is like 4.3 million. And in 2006, they had net immigration of around 124,000. They're running right now around 39,000 net in for 2009. But we see that net immigration picking back up for, you know, all kinds of reasons, including retirees and including 
the businesses moving from Southern California. So when you look at that and you say, okay, this area that net immigration is going to pick up, which is going to drive, continue to drive the demand for housing, for a lender, you know, it really would make sense to hold on to a property as opposed to, to just bail out completely on the property. So what they're trying to do may, in fact, make sense even from the self-interest standpoint of the people who hold the mortgages. Sure. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about your book for a moment here. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting book. Your latest book is entitled Bulls, Bears, and Golden Calves, Applying Christian Ethics in Economics. And you really mentioned some pretty interesting things here, just looking at your uh, one of your editorial reviews about how ethics are intertwined with economic and life analysis, the possibilities and perils of economic growth the role of government. You know, we've touched on some of these things. The growth of work and the loss of leisure, lending and borrowing, poverty and distributive justice, environmental stewardship, business and social responsibility, legalized gambling, the pornography industry, debt relief for less developed countries, economics of immigration, and population control. That's a lot. (laughs) You know, there's a lot in there. Tell us about the book. When you go back to Adam Smith, and he, he actually wrote two books, uh, and the first one was sort of a philosophy, philosophy book. And then he wrote Wealth and Nations. The famous one. The famous one. In the, in the first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, he actually said, you know, when people come before God, they're going to have a tough time because most of us don't live lives that are all that commendable. And that's the basis for him going on to say that not all people, but most people act in a self-interested way, uh, which is a Judeo-Christian foundational uh, element as well, that people are fallen. Well, Adam then said, okay, given that, how do you turn that to, so people won't destroy each other, and in fact, you can promote social welfare, you can promote the social good, given that reality of self-interested behavior. He said, well, the first thing is competition. You know, the only reason that 7-Eleven doesn't charge you $40 for a Slurpee is because there's other 7-Elevens and there's other places like Dunkin' Donuts now that give you something similar to a Slurpee. In other words, competition forces prices down. So that's number one. Number two, you have a judiciary system that enforces contracts and and kind of holds down abusive behavior. Number three, you have private property rights, which is an incentive for people to be good stewards of their their resources. So you have this combination of things that will work to steer self-interest behavior into a way that, in fact, is positive for society. But he also said, you know, you have to have some degree of moral consensus. You know, the court system can't do it all, and competition can't do it all. You know, if if uh, if people don't agree that child pornography is the bad thing, you're going to destroy your society. So he recognizes there's, there's a need for some agreement on basic values like honesty. If you don't have some amount of moral consensus, transactions costs go sky high. Even though the courts will, will enforce a contract that takes two or three years, in developing countries, you can't get a contract enforced because the, court, the courts are weak and they're also corrupt. So if you don't have some amount of moral con- consensus, nobody's going to trust anybody, and it's very hard for an economy to function, particularly a market economy. So taking a step further, are things, has God set things up in such a way that free markets and economies will function more efficiently if, in fact, people recognize natural law, you know, recognize God's law? So that, that was one of the compelling questions, is, is, is in fact, are free markets, in fact, more viable uh, in the context of Judeo-Christian ethics? Well, I would say they are, certainly, because if you can't trust the other party, it's just too hard to hold them accountable. You know, I always say the end result is, is the legal system. That's the, that's the last step anybody ever wants to take. God forbid you have to do it sometimes, but it's never profitable. Um, well, what, it what profit the lawyers. Well, yeah, but I'm not, I'm not looking to profit the lawyers. <laughs> I'm looking to profit myself. See, the invisible hand, self-interest. What is the alternative, though? I mean, are, are you comparing it to countries where people have less of an ethical context by which they govern their interactions just on an individual level? And like you mentioned before, a court system, a legal system that isn't transparent, it, it's more corrupt, uh, inaccessible in, in many countries. Right. The Judeo-Christian position is that God's laws have been revealed to everyone. So everyone down deep in their heart, you know, realizes that cheating and taking advantage of other people uh, are really against against God's will. Now, the Judeo-Christian ethics also says, hey, 
the longer you violate, you know, God's will, those natural laws, the easier it becomes. You know, you can get get hardened. Like a moral relativism uh, sort of evolves sure. within a within an individual, right? The interesting thing in developing countries with regards to, to corruption is that in developing countries where you have a better flow of information, there's less corruption. In developing countries where you have more newspapers, where you have more landline phones, where you have more cell phones, where you have more internet connections, in fact, the level of corruption goes down. Corruption is measured by the, uh, there's a corruption perception index put up by Transparency International. And this is statistically significant. I mean, I've, I've looked at it. So what does that say? It says, once somebody can find out that you're being corrupt, you're less likely to be corrupt. Okay. Sure. It also confirms, you know, Adam Smith, because, for example, now with cell phones, people leave the coast of India from these towns and villages. They go out in their wooden boats and they catch fish. They used to come back into the fish market, and they would take whatever price they were offered. Now they catch the fish, they get on their cell phone, and they call four or five fish markets, and they find out what price they can get for this, that, and the other, and that's where they, they go. So part of it, you know, part of this increased communications is breaking down bottlenecks and monopolies and oligopolies. But part of it, too, is just putting the, 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 the light of day on practices that people feel pretty embarrassed about once they're caught. I'm sure Matt off isn't delighted about what he's done with his life, you know, now that he's been caught. That is the tie-in. I mean, in, in countries like uh, Venezuela, where it's, it's a totally centralized power and you don't Resources are allocated on the basis of who Chavez likes and he, he doesn't like. The economy breaks down. They've got the worst economy in Latin America. It are actually starting to approach the African economies in terms of their standard of living. You know, a coercive system like that just doesn't function as well as the system where people are given freedom and freedom of choice. And the interesting thing is, Jason, when you go back to the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, God gave choice. Men and women, free choice. So in the book, you're looking again and again at how well do these different Judeo-Christian ethics function, and particularly with regards to to different market activity. Yeah, that's that's a fascinating topic to take on. You know, a few economists have uh, approached it from that angle, I, I would have to say, at least not that I know of. One of the things that's interesting about the communication aspect, shining light on people committing bad deeds, you look at the internet and, and you look at something like eBay, which I think is a really ingenious, and so many other websites are using that type of model. You look at Amazon.com. I can go on Amazon.com. I look up your book if it's a piece of junk. I'm going to look at the reviews. Knowing in looking at the reviews of a seller on eBay or a publisher of a book that some of the reviews will be fake, take everything with a grain of salt. You go online and you look at websites like Ripoff Report. Everybody's got some unhappy client out there somewhere or a competitor who is making false statements about them. But by and large, I, you know, I think as long as people are intelligent and, and they try to kind of sort in their own mind the wheat from the chaff, you know, these things are great tools, aren't they? Well, you know, Jason, and especially I especially appreciate investigative reporting. John Stossel. <laughs> yeah, and, and when Love him. You know, when Dan Rather came out with his condemnation of George Bush and these documents, within 15 the minutes, bloggers got the him. bloggers said, yeah. oh, these are off of typewriters that didn't exist at the time these documents were written. I know, that was great. Bang, you know, and it, and it just blew away the whole thing. And last night they came out with, in fact, the information that Mary Mapes, the producer, actually knew that George Bush had volunteered for Vietnam in 1970. So, but But the point is, that, as you were saying with the internet, it, so many people can quickly look at something, and, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's conservative or liberal. Like There was something about uh, Obama having a press conference or you know a town hall in Bozeman, Montana that we got that really was very, very critical of the president and so forth and so on. And my wife looked it up. She couldn't find it in the Bozeman papers. <laughs> And she, you know, she went to a number of these sites where they like urban legend type sites, and they said, "Yeah, you know, this, this is kind of, this may be a little bit hokey." It's it's terrific that the the information exchange is so quick. But as you say, you have to you have to be cautious. Take everything initially with a grain of salt. Don't overreact to it. Back it up by looking at multiple sources of information. But yeah, the the information is reducing the amount of discrimination, reducing the amount of oppression. Even what went on 
in Iran during this last election. Oh, yeah, Twitter could have saved the country. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out. But it, it didn't quite work it, out. It was but great the whole to have it there. world knows now that this is a sham. Yep. This government in Iran is a sham. Right. So it really is terrific. But so, and, and then you ask the question in the case of, uh, of Iran, you know, do they, do they realize that uh, disadvantaging women is really not something that, that is in accordance with God? I think they do because they're so defensive of it. And more, and the more the word leaks out that they're, you know, they're beating the heck out of their wives. The, the and stonings and all this crazy stuff. All yeah. this stuff. Yeah. That, the, the more embarrassed they become and the more likely it is that things will change in a, in a more in a positive direction. So Yeah, that's the great hope for humanity is economic and informational freedom, I think, will uh, really solve many, many of the world's problems. Well, many of the economists, but particularly, of course, Milton Friedman and his wife, they always felt that economic freedom was essential for political freedom. But the two, you just couldn't have one without without the other. And that's why I am very much in favor of a smaller government. It just... Uh, oh. <laughs> it, it just seems like everything the government gets into, it either mucks it up through uh, bureaucratic stupidity or corruption or some unintended consequence. I just think the whole thing is just make the government smaller. We all have our complaints about it. Make it do the basics to protect our freedoms, to provide the basic foundational things that the founding fathers of our country wanted to provide, and not get into all of these other things. I mean, it's just every time something like that is done, like this healthcare debate that's raging on right now, I don't know. Let's just look at the healthcare in the VA hospitals. Let's look at the efficiency level at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Let's look at the management of our social security system. No one would look at those as, as good examples. You're absolutely right, you know, Jason, that, and this argument, you know, goes back further than Adam Smith, but there are certain functions like roads and stop signs and national defense and bridges and, you know, that, that in fact require uh, some amount of, of liberty to be given over to government. And there's no question of that. Has it gotten out of hand? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah it sure <laughs> I, has. Yeah, I think you're <laughs> absolutely right that it, is, it has gotten out of hand. And the only thing you can think of doing that's effective is just reducing the size of the whole thing rather than arguing over the merits of... Of this or that. Just make it smaller. That. Yeah. Yeah, just, just just reduce the size of the whole thing, and that's the, that's the only way to get back to some, uh, some common sense. The, but, the, the power grabs and the corruption, they'll still be there. They'll just be smaller, and, and they'll have less impact. And, and that's why if you just make the government smaller, you solve a million problems. Well, you may have seen the, the, the I think it's on YouTube, on the John Murtha Airport. No. The John Murtha Airport, which is near Johnstown in the middle of, middle of Pennsylvania, and $150 million have been put into it. They just got stimulus money to repair a runway. They have one runway that will accommodate any plane in the world. It's so big, okay? They have three flights a day out of there. All three are to Washington, D.C. Each one uh, subsidizes the passenger's tickets, the $100 a ticket. They probably have 20 passengers a day. Wow. It's another Amtrak, okay. you know, another you know, mess. Would a, yeah. would a market economy have put an airport there and the people who live there they interview them oh i love it you know the no parking problems. right oh sure security. you do there's 20 <laughs> people on the plane <laughs> that's great <laughs> it's, 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 uh, but that's what comes when you have course of power and 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 resources coming out of a centralized uh a centralized source you get some crazy things like that and for every john murtha i'm sure there's somebody in congress who's a a wonderful person and a forthright person. But once you've centralized power like that and let somebody be able to grab money like that, you're going to have somebody who's not a good egg. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no question about it. The central planning has never worked. Uh, it doesn't work anywhere on the planet. It hasn't worked anywhere in history. There's no example of success that any of the proponents of it can give. When you ask them that, they just they can't come up with an example. And I, I my feeling is, you know, there there were our economists who were very very much in favor of the stimulus package, and who in fact favor another stimulus. And to me, in talking to them, what they didn't get is that you know you, you are going to lose freedom and liberty when government gets larger, and that's going to that's going to dampen innovation and entrepreneurship. In other words, they they didn't understand the political economy, the whole thing. They just said, oh, there's a government multiplier. And if government chucks uh, a couple trillion dollars out there, we're going to get a multiplier of 1.8 or whatever it might be. But, you know, you, you obviously grasp that. And the, I think what's showing up in these town hall meetings, the frustration is people see their lives being diminished because government is getting bigger. 
Well, that leads me to my last question for you. Sure. And I think, of course, it stifles innovation and entrepreneurship and all of the stuff you just mentioned. It also, I think, has a um, devastating effect on the value of money. And I see a lot of inflation coming down the pike, maybe 18 months, two years away. I, I think we're going to start seeing it. What do you think? Uh, I agree with you. We're not in the majority. There's a minority in the Federal Reserve, and there are a minority of economists who agree with you as well. But I, I'm I'm in your camp. What is that going to look like for people when the when I think we're going to have a Jimmy, a Jimmy Carter economy because we already know that it's going to take about four years. You know, it's going to take till 2014 for the national unemployment rate to get back down to between five and six percent. So in 2010, 2011, we already know we're going to have high unemployment, you know, 8%, 9%. And I think we're going to have rising prices, you know, for the reasons that we talked about before and just as you think we're going to have. And that's the Jimmy Carter economy. You know, right. That's taxation. I agree. So uh, investors need to concentrate on protecting themselves from inflation. We talk a lot about that on the show. We won't bother getting into it now because I you're have right. kept you no, way right. too long. You are very interesting, John. No, it's fun. <laughs> It was, and yeah. it was fun talking to you. You really, uh, you really have a great deal of knowledge about a lot of things with regards to economics. So I think your listeners do well by tuning in to hear you. Well, <laughs> I don't know about your guests, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love my guests too. And and John, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been very enlightening. Bulls, bears, and golden calves available on Amazon.com, and I assume at all the major bookstores, right? Right, and it's actually on Kindle. Oh yes, I have my Kindle, and I love my Kindle. I, I got it. Yeah, and then and for those people who are interested. There's actually a uh, edition of it that's in Korean. <laughs> well, fantastic. So, so for our so Korean don't listeners. Me, don't ask me why. That's what, when I have to send a free copy to people, I send them the Korean one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you sent me the real one, so I appreciate uh, no, that. I or the okay. English version, I should say. What other websites would you like to give out? Of course, uh, economy.com, I'm sure. Really, there's, there's uh, no, I mean, people are so internet savvy that I don't have. But economy.com for people who, who are really interested in staying on top of what's going on in the national level, and then if they want to, at the state or local level, economy.com, our, our dismal scientist website, is, I think is just terrific. I enjoy it myself. So. And that's how we found you, because I saw you quoted somewhere representing economy.com, and, and glad I had you on the show. Uh, well, John, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it, and we'll let you go. Thanks for staying long. Okay, Jason. Okay. Take care. Have a good day. Okay. Bye now. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, all rights reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.